once again, Phillip Island has given us just a little taste of everything, as it likes to do. We had lashing wind and rain, good racing. As always, at Phillip Island, you get great racing. We had wildlife interference, which is a staple of life at Phillip Island. We had a hometown hero get on the podium. And we even had randomly issues and dramas revolving around tear-offs. So we are going to cover everything when I start in MotoGP. As always, everything is chaptered below. Skip ahead to whatever is important to you. And uh, before we start, we are on currently 691 subscribers. We've been stuck on about 690 for like, I want to say like over a month probably. And it would be nice to get to 700 just for the end of the season, just to round us off at a nice 700 on the dot, just to end the season would be nice. So if you're first time watching or you've been watching a few and you haven't subscribed yet, just help us. We just need nine. Just help us push to 700 and then we'll crack on from there into the off season. I guess the first person to talk about is Mark Marquez because he was absolutely brilliant this weekend. Both races had issues either off the start or into turn one. And on both of them was absolutely mega in his uh, comeback. So Saturday saw him come back to second, and you think probably that's that's the ominous sign for everyone is that he probably was going to win that race had he not had that issue. Like just by looking at his pace, he was on leader's pace. Even though Martin was excellent in that, you think over race distance, Mark not having that issue off the start will probably be definitely challenging with nothing to lose. So if he forces the issue, Martin's just going to let him have it. And then... The kicker was that he did have the issue off the start on Sunday and still just came back and did the job anyway. Like, what did Mark do well this weekend? I mean, obviously, you're at a proper rider's circuit, as they say with Phillip Island. You hear this a lot, people's analysing the Grand Prix in the weekend. Rider's circuit, and it is. That's why you always get strange results at Phillip Island. When I say strange, I mean guys on bikes that are usually not as good or they underperform a little bit, but, you know, you get good riders who may be in windy conditions or strange conditions like we had on Friday into Saturday where maybe you had to be willing to risk pushing it in not ideal conditions. Um, you see those guys sort of come to the front. Mark said in his interview after the race, it, you know, it's a kind of circuit because it's not so stop start. It is the kind of circuit where you can follow a little bit and he excels in those conditions. Very much the kind of circuit where you can find the rider makes up a lot of the difference that normally sometimes the bike can't. Now, in saying that, it was a Ducati white wash. So maybe it was just between the Ducatis that that happened. But, you know, we did have periods of the race where, you know, guys like Binder were running near the front, just showing a little bit. So in that sense, that is where you see guys like Mark coming to the front in a race like this. I think one of the things that stood out for me, often when we were seeing maybe the overhead shots from the helicopter or the onboard shots were, now we always talk about Mark as a left-hand corner guy, but going into turn four, now called Miller Corner, the old Honda, the old Honda Corner. It just seemed like more than anyone else, he was firing in at that apex. As, as you know, it's a big, tight right-hand hairpin type corner. And you'd be like, well, he's missed that. <laughs> he's gone so deep, but every single time, it was just, he was gaining like a couple of bike lengths on everyone and just getting it pulled up. It's something I noticed. Maybe it's just the few times they showed it or the times he really attacked it. But it just seemed like every time I was watching him go into that corner, that's what was happening. And then that, showed itself in the, I want to say that was the race winning overtake because there was an overtake earlier. He went past Martin, but Martin had run wide and Mark had taken advantage, but I think Martin got him back again after that. And then the race winning overtake was, I think the one where he really took Martin, he, big, big old block pass. And this one, he didn't quite make the apex, but real hard move. And you just know, like I said earlier, in that situation, Martin has to let that slide. Leading the world championship, don't get in that scrap. Don't get yourself in a position where he could take you out because Mark's got nothing to lose. He's just here to win races now. Championship's gone for him. He's just there to win races. So he's going to do everything he can to win the race. If you try and force the issue with him and you think back to Peko doing that with Alex Marquez at Aragon, don't put yourself in that situation. Martin just was like, look, you've taken me wide. He's taken the corner. He's away now and I've got no answer for him. I'll come second. So yeah, Mark was mega. And I do want to, I, I, speaking of Mark, I do want to emphasize the point that like, I, maybe I'm not remembering what Mark was like as a character when he was at Honda and, you know, the Mark era, we was winning everything. He just looks so relaxed now. And he's joking and laughing with the reporters and the journalists and big smile on his face the whole time. I mean, I know he obviously, when he wins, he's always going to be happy. He was always happy when he won in the past, but it just seems a little bit different now. Maybe I'm not remembering back, but they might have to go and remember. Maybe it was always like that. 
go back and watch some old interviews with him, but it just seems a little bit different now. And I'm wondering if that'll switch next season when, let's be honest, is he your title favorite now for next season without seeing anything of what preseason testing may bring? And is the GP25 going to be that much better than the 24? Will it bring the guys on the older bikes back into play? You don't know, but, and, and you know, will it bring... You know, the Aprilia is with Martin going there into play and the KTMs with Acosta on a factory KTM. You don't know what it's going to be like, but if it goes on trending the way it has been and it's just going to be Ducati dominance with his main rival looking like it's just going to be him versus Peko, he's got to be a title favorite at this point, I would have thought. Um, with Peko showing a lot of weakness again, we'll get into that. This relaxed nature going to next year, if it is a scrappy title fight next year with Peko, does that demeanor change but i mean for now he just looks like he's really enjoying himself and i did think it was i said earlier in the year where the dancing on the podium and all stuff seemed a bit forced like it was, it was almost like a pr move kind of thing wasn't it but i mean genuine what i saw from the interviews this weekend and stuff a genuine relaxed nature and having a laugh and enjoying himself so interesting to see if that changes when he gets into a real title scrap next year although it might not be a scrap it could just be him absolutely wassing it now we talk about martin 20 point lead now Talk about Martin and Peko. 20-point lead now. Peko struggling again. And both the factory Ducati struggled this weekend, which was interesting. Bastianini wasn't really there at all either. It's it's line in the sand time for Peko. Thailand has to be his line in the sand. If he doesn't get anything out of Thailand, he's leaving it. Like, if he drops even five points to Martin in Thailand, you'd have to think it's just about cooked. Because then when you get to Malaysia, Martin will only need X amount of points kind of thing so martin will really only need however many points stay within touching distance for the next two grand prix he can let peko win it you know if he gains points on him in thailand now i do think the way it works now mathematically peko just wins all the next grand prix does he still win the title something like that there's something like that going on so it is in his own hands but the form that they're both in he really needs martin to not score in one of the races next week basically nine, 10 points or something. But then even then, Peko, you'd think, has to win that. I know it's 37 points are available each weekend, but you're looking at the form here. I know Peko won in Japan, so it seems odd to be talking about it this way. It was only a Grand Prix ago, but what I'm getting at is Peko's thing at the moment is it's just the way Peko's always been. If he doesn't win, it's not usually like he's just right behind in second. It's usually a bit of a disaster. And I say that again, maybe I'm being a bit over the top, but Third place is a disaster. She was third place in Indonesia, third place here again at Phillip Island. Not a disaster, but it's not quite what Martin's doing. So at the moment, when Martin doesn't win, I'm going to go back to his results here. From Silverstone, so from the British Grand Prix, he's been second. This is just Grand Prix results. We can talk about sprints and all that, but it's going to take too long. Grand Prix results, second, second, second. And then we got to Mazzano one where he made that error in judgment. So he only picked up one point there. And then second in Mazzano two. He won in Indonesia, then second, second, the last two Grand Prix. So when he's not winning, he's coming second. And the thing is, it's not Peko winning all those Grand Prix. He's not dropping points to Peko. Most of those times he's come second in those. It's been Bastianini or Marquez winning the race. So he's still gaining points on Peko. Peko's not doing that. We're seeing here he's struggling along. He's grafting to third place, but Martin's been second. Not finished in Aragon. He's not finished in Mazzano 2. This is Peko. So when he's not been winning, he's either been third or no points. So when you look at it now, he might go and win two of the next three Grand Prix, but it might not be enough because he might only be gaining five points a, sh a, a go on Martin. And with the four marks in, and you know Pastianini can do anything on any day sometimes if he gets somewhere and he's feeling it, which means that even if he is quicker than Martin at all three of these next Grand Prix, he might not be quicker than one of those other two guys, which means the point gain might not be enough. And Martin's doing enough, and I think his head's in the right space enough where he can probably just go, I'll just, if he comes second, I'll come third. If he comes third, I'll come fourth, even if I don't have his pace that weekend. If he comes first, I'll come second. I don't think there's going to be the big gaps that Banyaya loses on these weekends. So tell me what you think about it, because I, I, points gap aside, You'd think Martin's form of just being able to come second every week. And I was critical of this because I was like, I don't like the idea of some guy winning three Grand Prix, another guy winning eight or nine, and the guy who won three wins the world championship. I still kind of agree. I think that is a result of sprint races, though. But if consistency has always been a thing in racing, the point system, I think, is very good in that it does reward guys. So if you're going to go win and then crash, then win and then crash, you're not going to make as many points up as the guy who just comes second or third every week. So 
it is designed in that way. The sprint races have obviously helped Martin because Peko's a bit of a grinder when it comes to getting into weekends. And we saw that big time this weekend. But it does put Martin in the best position because even if Mark's quicker than him next in the next few Grand Prix or Bastianini or even Peko, you know he's probably going to be second by the way he's been going. He can extract that from the bike. And it is an interesting thing between the two of them. So on a weekend where you do get changeable weather on the Friday and it does take you longer to get into the weekend, and Pecco's a guy who really does have to feel the weekend out. Sometimes we don't see him turn up until the Sunday. So Martin's just like, roll it out the truck and he'll just push it. And he just pushes and pushes and pushes. And sometimes it works out for him like this weekend where he's just on it straight away. Well, he did have to work into Friday like everyone, but come Saturday afternoon, he's on it. And that's going to give him a huge advantage, I think, going into these next few rounds because Pecco doesn't have time to do that anymore. He just needs to roll it out the truck and be like, I'm on this weekend. He really does, especially next weekend. All right, so that's your front runners. Digi was good this weekend, finished fourth. It'll be good for him going into next season, especially since he is now going to miss the last few Grand Prix. Uh, he's going in for surgery. And interestingly, we're going to be seeing a World Superbike rider possibly for Ducati coming across to jump on that VR46 bike. Talk of... This is the fun one. Andrea Iannone is, is looking like one of the favorites to get the nod. That is like the fun option. That's the chaos option. Like, let's let's see that. I do think seeing Bulliger get on the bike would be fairest possible result. Yeah, Bulliger's, I, th- I think, really earned it. But whether it's... I don't know whose decision it is. Is Ducati going to go, we're going to send you someone? Is Rossi going, no, 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 I want him? Or whoever's running the team. Or maybe it's Uchiro's decision. I don't know. I think the... The fun option is, you know, no, just to see because he's been out for so long and obviously his first season back in World Superbike. So maybe he is still better than like a Bulliger, but that we're just waiting to see it again because he's had so much time off the bike. And maybe as when it comes to a MotoGP, you know, a guy with experience on MotoGP, like he used to be very, very good in MotoGP, race winner. Maybe that will get them more than just chucking a Bulliger on for the first time. So, you know, we'll see how that goes. That looks fun. Uh, and I think that's all I got for MotoGP this weekend, except for loaded up. It's the All Japan Cup. Fabio Quattararo with another All Japan Cup win. And once again, a really impressive performance from him. He's finished ninth on the day. This guy is elite, elite level MotoGP, world class. Next up this weekend was Zarco. He finished 12th on the road. He was followed closely by Rins and Luca Marini. Luca Marini had a really good weekend, I think. He got a top 10 in the sprint. Now, Saturday, there was loads and loads of crashes. Obviously, the changeable weather condition, we hadn't had a lot of dry running. People were pushing. We saw a lot of guys go down. So he's inherited a lot of those positions. But top 10 on the day, can't argue with that. He was genuinely quicker than a few of the other Hondas. I want to say probably Taka and Mir over the weekend. Am I right in saying he was quicker than Mir over the weekend? I think he was running ahead of him even when Mir went down. We'll get into that. So it was Marini in fourth. Taka struggled. He, He finished 18th. He was probably last of the main runners that finished the race. Bez, have I missed something during the race? He's finished 45 seconds off the lead and 15 seconds behind Taka. I'm not sure what happened to him during the race. He had a massive crash on. Actually, we can talk about that. We forgot about that. We'll talk about that after the All Japan Cup. His crash at the weekend um, on Saturday. So I don't know what happened to him on... Was he just like really sore and just putting around or did he have an incident and get... I, I missed that. I missed that completely. Mir DNF. Another DNF for me. He really is still struggling on the Honda. Really still struggling. And I think if he has another similar season next season, I think, well, I don't know, tell me what you think. Are we going to see him get to the end of the season? Or will it be one of those ones where he's crashing every week again next season on a really uncompetitive bike? Is he just going to be like, look, lads, let's call it a day here. Chuck Bradle on it for the rest of the season. I'll go rest up for six months and see if I can get another contract somewhere else next year. Maybe he's a, he'll get an eye off the second Yamaha seat or something. one of the second Yamaha seats. One of the Pramac seats is what I mean. One of the Pramac seats for next season because we know that Oliveira and Miller are very much... It's going to be like do or die for both of them, I think. Uh, so in the standings, Fabio, 128 points. He's, he's, he's pretty... Is he mathematically won it? Yes, he has. Uh, with 30 points left available in the All Japan Cup. He is your All Japan Cup champion. He might have been last week, actually. Let's have a look, shall we? Yeah. yeah he was. He was your All Japan Cup champion. Forgot to announce that last week. He was already the champion. He is still the champion. We'll put up a little thing making him the champion of... Now, Zarko's on 77. Tack has lost touch with him a little bit now. He's 67. Rins goes to 52. He'll finish fourth, I believe, unless he can catch Tacker. Could be on. Could be on. Me now level with Marini on 39 points. That's going to have to go to count back at the end of the season if we if it finishes like that. 
Bradle on seven, Romeo on four. I don't know if we're going to see either of those again or if we're seeing anyone else at all. There was talk of Dovi. I can't remember. I'm sure we'll see someone at least in maybe Malaysia or Valencia. I don't know. One of them. Okay, and then we'll, I did say we're going to talk about the crash with Bez and Vinales. Now, it's one of those ones like if you go into the back of someone else, you're always at fault, right? Do I then think that Bez, he was at fault? I think it was a really unfortunate one. I think something... You do hear a lot about when... The only thing back in the day, you see that a lot, and it wouldn't really affect the bike in front, pulling back in front of it. Then they both get on the brakes, and then it doesn't really matter. These days, with the aero, it does. There is obviously talk that it does take away a lot of the downforce. I still don't blame the guy in front for pulling in front, it's just a natural thing to do. But what it can do is, I think probably what's happened is it's removed a lot of that downforce. And then you see him, he tries to avoid it at all costs. He tries, as soon as he realizes, bang. He's willing to send himself down the road rather than take Mav with him, but it just... Mav was right there. Couldn't do anything. Basically, bang on the brake into a big stoppy, and then from there went flying into Mav, but it looked like he was just binning it to try and miss the contact. For me, it looked like that's what he was trying to do, which into turn one is brave as fuck because that is quick. Unfortunately, still made contact with Mav in the end. Look, a lot of people talk about Mav's reaction. He obviously doesn't know that's what happened. But for me, whilst I'm saying he doesn't, he thinks he's just been taken out, he's obviously reacted angrily. My initial reaction, and I still kind of hold it a little bit, is don't be a dick. Don't be a dick. If that guy's standing up being like, the guy's face down in the fucking dirt, you know you've had big accidents in the past yourself. You've lived in an era where, you know, guys have been killed on track and seriously injured. Maybe while he's lying face down in the dirt, not moving, maybe don't just fucking give him the finger, mate. Just take it easy. I know it's emotional. I know it's hard to control your emotions. Maybe we all would have reacted the same. It's hard to say. That's why I'm giving him benefit of the doubt. But at the time, I did think to myself, he's lying face down in the dirt, mate. Just maybe just walk off. Maybe just walk off. Maybe swear inside your head, be like, this guy's an absolute twat, blah, 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 this, that. First of all, give it one of these. And then... Later on, when he still hasn't moved for about 30 seconds, then gave him the finger. <sighs> calma, calma, calma. You know, take it easy. But yeah, while I think, you know, it might be a bit over the top, some people having a go at Mav for it, which I know I've just done. Like, let the guys have their reactions. But personally, internally, I'm thinking, maybe unless he's moving. <laughs> just lay off a bit. Like... Okay, but it is Mav. And these Spaniards, they get a bit like that. You see it with like a leash. I don't know. Maybe I'm stereotyping. But the Spaniards are fiery, aren't they? I mean, the Italians in in their own way as well. On to Moto2. Big Senna. Get in, lad. Now, there was a moment. Now, this this battle for the lead was excellent. I really enjoyed this race. I thought probably... I mean, the Mark comeback was great to watch. Really exciting. Finished that race-ish. Um... The move to win it, what I've mentioned, was was excellent um, and hard and aggressive, and I liked it. This, I thought, was probably the best race of the weekend. Moto3 was chaos, but it ended in a bit of a whimper with Alonso doing his thing. So this, I think, the last lap duel, I like this the best, I think. Just a classic old 1v1, just like 1v1 me, mate. And Fermin, hard but fair, are we going with? There was contact, and his opponent did end up off the road, so it's maybe borderline. Part of me, like when I'm thinking to myself, in fairness of competition and rules and stuff, if you make contact and the guy doesn't make the corner, is it maybe a bit naughty? Can we maybe see an intervention from stewards there? But also, I'm a big old... Let them play! Let the boys play! Let the boys play kind of guy. So I actually have no issue with this being non penalized or whatever. And Fermin himself did make the corner. If he didn't make the corner again, I think it's a different story again. I actually think there's nothing wrong with this move. Even though from like a rules standpoint, uh, yeah, technically, whatever. I have no issue with it because I want to see them doing this kind of thing. But there was a point during this move down at the old MG, about here, where I thought Senna was going to win the Grand Prix. I was 100% sure these were both going down. I was like, and they both stayed on. And while I was like, oh yeah, good pass, good win for Fermin, I was also a little bit like, ah, shit kind of wish they both just went down there (laughs) like that would have been amazing but Senna was great Senna was great Fermin was excellent he's 
there were doubts. I was one of the skeptics about the um, perhaps premature decision by Ducati to bring him in, and he has not had a great season, but it's still there. He's showing it. Guys, it's still there. You never know with this kid. He could go and win the next three. It's that He's that kind of guy. Uh, Kanet, good again. He's had a really good finish to the season. I think he's been excellent. Um, he seems to have... Look, I know he's not picked up the win in the last couple. You know, he's still a very much a bridesmaid, isn't he? He's got, a, what, three second places out of his last five and one win. So still playing the bridesmaid a little bit, not picking up the win when he could do. But, you know, he's second in the World Championship. I think he's had a fantastic second half of the season. Really, I think he's been brewing since where we're looking at here. Since uh, the British Grand Prix. Been on the podium almost every week since then. So fantastic. Lopez crush. Agura is pretty much a world champion now. 65 points. Obviously, he's lost points to Canet there, but he's not lost much. So it's not enough. Canet, he just needs to be finishing these in these sort of positions. He's picked up 13 points there. It's good enough. Fourth place in it. So so he'll be fine with that. That's not going to be a problem. Unless the demons of Sepang come back to haunt him in a couple of weeks' time. But I don't think it will because I think next week in Thailand, he's probably going to finish top three or four again and it'll be... Furman the Vermin and Garcia still in this, technically, uh, with only being a point behind Canet. It's still kind of on, but it's not. Moto3, Alonso, this was straight. This was weird, wasn't it? On a circuit where you just can't get away from people because of the slipstream, he got away from everyone. So, uh, I mean, and then in the title fight for that one, I mean, we know we're done, but in for second place, Olgado takes a commanding lead. Well, I call it a lead. It's commanding second. 23 points ahead of Colin Vaya now, who was involved, I think it was his own doing, in an incident with um, Ivan Ortola, so they both missed out. And Danny Olgado, who's one that I kind of, I don't know why I don't rate him as high as the likes of Vaya and Ortola most, most of the time, because he always does a good job. He's just not as exciting, is he? But probably because he's been there a bit longer maybe than like a Vaya, so he, he's been doing this for two, I don't know. But he's been excellent again, I think. So he picked up a good second place. The real story of the day was almost uh, Stefano Nepper, who run, did two long laps, gave himself another almost long lap, and then had a bizarre incident where he got almost taken out. Big hit. How he didn't go down, I don't know, from his teammate um, uh, Nicola Carraro. Bashed into him. And he stayed on, and all that all that happened. And he was only pipped for third. Almost got on the podium. There was only... You could have thrown a blanket over the three of them who finished uh, the second, third, fourth, and fifth. So the battle for second actually was great. If that was a battle for the win, it would have been race of the weekend, but it wasn't. Because it was chaos at the start. The early laps were brilliant. The lead group of like 20 dudes. Kelso was leading it. And Kelso, big improvement. And the thing we're always critical of Kelso on is the fact that he doesn't like to scrap so hard. This week he scrapped. He ended up falling away and... and to be fair, some of it wasn't his fault. He did get nerfed out at one point, so that was unlucky. And he never was able to make the ground up because it was just so intense in there with guys just... Every time you went past someone, they went back past you. He was really trying to be in the lead. He was trying to be in the front three the whole time. If he just tried that more often, I think he'd, he'd be doing a lot better in the championship. But it was brilliant to see. That's all I asked for from, from Kelso is to just... When you're in those positions and you're leading or you're in the top three or four and someone shuffles you back to fifth, sixth, seventh, nah, fuck them. Just go back at them. So... He didn't do. He doesn't do that normally, but this week he really did. And uh, you know, we'd like to see him do that somewhere other than Phillip Island uh, from now on. And just quickly on Alonso again, this kid's got loads of character. It's hard not to like this kid. He's absolutely brilliant. He's done the Rossi eleven win celebration. Great. Went into his interview afterwards, and every time this kid speaks, I like him a little bit more. Every time he opens his mouth, I'm like, I really like this kid. He's so cool and humble. You know, to go in there and be like, oh, this is a tribute to Valentino and just to thank Valentino for like what he's done for the sport. The sport's only what it is now because of him and all this stuff. Really nice to hear from a young guy that he recognises. And obviously these kids grow up watching Valentino and stuff as well, but to recognise the past generations. And you see it with guys like Pedro as well, where he like idolises Kevin Schwantz and things like that. So, you know, seeing these kind of things from lads like him and like I said with Pedro and stuff like that, where they, they show a lot of character, they're very likeable and... They like to give a nod to the years gone by as well. Can't ask for more than that. Absolutely brilliant from the kid. And that's all for this week. We'll see you in Thailand next weekend. How's everyone doing with the with the early starts? It's, uh, geez, I've had some tired days at work, I'll tell you that much. But yeah, we're off to Thailand. It'll be another early one. I think we'll be, I don't know what time zone there. It'll be more back to like the Japan ones. The Australia one's worse because Melbourne time zone, I think, is a, 
couple of hours ahead of Japan, maybe. So we get it at an even worse time in Europe. But this will, I think, this does Thailand go back to them that more the Japan time zone? I don't know. We'll see when we get there. Someone let me know in the comments. What time zone are you on? The Thailand viewers, what time zone are you on? You're not on the Melbourne time zone or you're more the, the Tokyo time zone. Let me know. Okay. See you after the next one. Oh, I just want to say thanks. The last few weeks, I've been meaning to say this every bloody week and I always forget. I've been getting loads of great comments on all the videos, the shorts I've been releasing based on the longer form videos of these, even on these videos and then on the uh, on the posts. So I haven't done the... We're finally back up to date on the... Um, took me about six races. Finally back up to date on the power rankings. So I'll put them out again just after this video. Uh, getting great comments on everything. And, uh, and I try and reply to absolutely everything as often as I can because I don't have that many subscribers. So I've got time to, to answer them all. So... Cheers. Thank you very much. See you on the next one.